Stephanie. You're now being recorded. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, folks. Um, wherever you are, my name is Somnath Batabial. I am an associate professor at SOAS, the Center for Global Media and Communications, but that is not the hat I'm wearing today. I'm coming in here uh, as one of you folks uh, wanting, thinking about getting published in the near future, and I'll tell you that story as we go along. But our main focus of attention today is on Jack Ram, my fellow panelist, agent, and um, former commissioning editor at Viking. Um, I'll, Jack will introduce himself, then I'll tell you a bit more about me and why I am here, and then we'll move into our question and answer session. And I'll tell you more about it, things as we go along. So welcome everyone. Uh, Jack, over to you. Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks very much for the introduction, Somnath. Um, and thanks to SOAS, I guess, for putting this event on. Um, I hope it will be really useful for, for everybody. Um, so we were just talking at the very beginning and there's, there's a kind of chat box. So if you, as, as we're talking and stuff like that, if you guys have comments and things like that, then um, do feel free to um, use that function. Um, but there's also uh, the kind of Q&A box, which we'll maybe get to later to answer specific questions that you might have um, about the, the topics that kind of come up through the course of today. Um, so as Somnath mentioned, um, I work in publishing and I figured I would tell you a few things about what I've done over the years um, and how potentially, I guess, that those experiences might um, be useful for, for you to think about um, when considering your own work and submitting to literary agents or, or whatever it is that you might be doing next with your, with your writing. So after university, which for me was at the University of East Anglia, where I studied literature and, and creative writing, um, I moved to London and I worked at the Eve White Literary Agency, which is a small literary agency um, representing all kinds of different writers, um, various kinds of, of fiction, also children's fiction um, and then non-fiction. After a few years of working as an assistant there um, and doing a lot of editing, um, helping Eve, who was the, who ran the agency and was the kind of, uh, who was my boss. I helped her sort of with the editing of particularly her adult fiction list, which grew a lot in those, in those sort of three or four years whilst I was assisting. After that, I had my own list um, and was a kind of agent in my in my own right, um, under the umbrella of the of the um, of the agency. So I was almost like a kind of orbiting moon of the the planet of of Eve White Literary Agency, and I um, sort of specialised in in what we would tend to call literary fiction, um, and I worked with or sort of discovered and helped get the careers started of people like Daisy Johnson and Jesse Greengrass, a guy called Chris Power. And then in nonfiction, um, I worked with uh, various different types of often sort of narrative nonfiction authors, people like Damien LeBar, who wrote uh, Stopping Places. Um, Darren Anderson, whose recent work Tide Rack just came out um it's not called that actually it's called inventory now but it's it was originally called tag back um and, and many others to boot um after about six or seven years working at the agency um about sort of three years being an agent and and for sort of being either an assistant or sort of uh, a little of both um i moved over to penguin where i was a commissioning editor for non-fiction at viking Viking is the sort of um, the sort of like literary, but but um, but sort of um, chart focused part of of um, of the Penguin side of the Penguin Random House Group, which is just a giant kind of company um, that includes lots of different uh, divisions and imprints therein. Whilst there, I I sort of changed focus, I suppose, as a, as a literary agent, essentially what you're doing is selling 
books to um, publishers and as a commissioning editor you're buying books the majority of the kind of work that I was doing um, didn't necessarily involve agents I would go out into the world and find new writers um, my particular focus I suppose at Viking was working with often with academics for instance um, or experts in various ways um, and helping them to write books for a sort of general audience rather than for an academic or for a, a specialist audience. Um, so during that time, I worked with people like Iggy Pop, the, um, the musician, and uh, David Omond, who is the former director of GCHQ, the intelligence uh, agency. Um, a guy called Roger Kneebone, who is a, an academic at Imperial in London, um, who, so recent book expert was just published and I was there for sort of two years a big part of my job was um, commissioning but the other key part of my job I suppose was editing particularly because I was working with people who hadn't necessarily thought about writing books before or certainly writing books for a general audience I did a lot of of working with the authors to sort of help them come up with feasible structures that they could um apply to their books and just helping them um, from the sort of most macrocosmic um, editorial process, i.e. making sure that chapter one, chapter two, chapter three are all on themes that sort of follow on from each other, um, right down to the sort of more microcosmic line editing. So making sure that sentences sound nice and compelling and um, have a certain aesthetic quality to them as well. Um, after two and a bit, well, yeah, I think about two years at Penguin, I left and I set up my own business where I sort of put together the two roles. So I do a little bit of um, agenting, which we can talk more about. I, I'm sure we will over the course of this uh, seminar or, or whatever. Um, I also edit for various publishing houses and also for, you know, other kind of what might be described as kind of content producers. I, I do some work with Audible, for instance, um, the audiobook publishers. Um, and I also do a sort of hybrid version of publishing that I don't think anybody else is really doing, where I'll work with a publisher to come up with ideas for books and then find um, authors to write them. And that's both in fiction and nonfiction. So for instance, with a more commercial novel, there may be a good idea for it um, and I'll look to find uh, a, a, an author with a reasonable level of experience to help bring it to life um, or similarly in nonfiction perhaps there's uh, as I sort of mentioned I was doing at Viking or maybe work with an academic or something like that um, to try and popularize their research um, and in the agenting side I basically just work with stuff that I like um, mainly fiction, though it's quite broad, um, or sort of narrative-led non-fiction, for instance, memoir, or some kind of crossover type thing. I like authors like Maggie Nelson, for instance, and I've recently sold a book to Chatter and Windus um, that's a kind of experimental non-fiction type piece. So that's a rough sort of precy of the last 10 years of my life and my working life at any rate. And um, I hand over to you, Son. Thanks, Jack. Wow, uh, that that was fantastic. I, I, I um, now have to match up and say why I should also be here co-paneling with you. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I was saying, I, I, my one of the hats I wear at Salas is as an academic, as Jack was saying, that uh, he works with academics like me to bring out books which are, which we are specialists or experts in in that particular subject, but. Jack and I met differently. We met because of my interest in fiction uh, and in writing um, literary fiction. I was part of the Jaipur Literature Festival, which is one of the, the largest literary festival anywhere in the world. And I, I have been attending there as a panelist, as a writer for a few years. And we met a couple of years, a couple of years back, Jack? Was it 2017, 18? Yeah, it was 18, two years ago, 2018. Yeah, 2018, January, uh, we met. 
Uh, I was at a, so I have published academic books uh, with Routledge with, um, I have published nonfiction, with, uh, fiction with HarperCollins, um, which, but for the last eight to nine years, I've been working on uh, what writers call their, the big novel. Uh, I started off uh, on my own, not knowing how long it will go on, how long the research would be, how long the writing would be. And it ended up to be about eight years. And I met Jack <clears throat> in Jaipur and we had a brief chat. He was with Viking then. And I told him where I was and I was feeling a bit lost after you know, the manuscript, which has gone up to about 250,000 words, come down to about 160. Um, so I was a bit lost. Then uh, I was in India for about a year on research. And then when I came back, Jack and I met and he was in the process of uh, quitting biking and setting up his own agency. And I sent him three chapters of the novel, like many of you will be thinking of doing. And, and we met after a month or so and Jack offered very kindly to take me on. That was about a year back. This last year has been tough. We have gone through four drafts, uh, intense amounts of work, completely tearing apart the fabric of the novel and putting it back together. And as Jack said, the final line edits, which we have just finished. And um, we plan to go out next week to publishers, um, <laughs> fingers crossed. So that is the story of um, how we came together and why I felt that I'm almost quite close to where you folks might be in wanting to think about publishing, how to publish, how to look for an agent, what kind of publishers you'd want to go through. And so therefore what now I'll try and do is almost act like one of the audience and ask questions of Jack with the added advantage of having worked with him and um, perhaps a few steps closer to being published than many of you would be. So that's where I, I come in um, into this. I hope that's uh, clear. If you have any queries, I'll, I'll take those questions or put them in the chat, chat uh, window and uh, I'll see, um, I'll try and attend to those. Um, Talking of, uh, I noticed that um, we have a, a question from Vidya. Um, I suppose we're now in this sort of more conversational Element. Yeah. I'll just go ahead with this. Yeah, so yeah, please. Vidya asks um, if there's an example of an academic work that worked very well as a non fiction book, could you please cite some examples? It would be useful for us, for most university students, to understand how to turn an academic thesis into a readable book. Um, in a, well, I, I think, in a sense, um, they are different. I don't think that, they, I don't think it's, they, they're, a, a thesis is, is for such a clearly different audience and, and has to sort of jump through certain um, specific hoops. I don't actually know very much about academic publishing, but as I understand, there's, you know, there's a process that, uh, that a thesis has to go through before it can be deemed publishable. There's like a review process and things like that. And obviously that's not necessary for, um, for a more general nonfiction. Um, perhaps it's easiest for me to talk about, um, say, Roger Kneebone, who I, who I mentioned earlier, who is an academic, he's at Imperial. His research is um, about education, ultimately. Um, and he runs an MA in, he was a surgeon, um, and he runs an MA in what he describes as surgical education, which is basically looking at ways to teach surgeons and in particular looking outside of the field of surgery um, to see if there is some kind of um, sort of interdisciplinary cross-pollination and through sort of long years of teaching this course and publishing uh, papers and stuff like that um, he has developed a kind of idea about what it what becoming an expert um, requires of you. And so that was what his book was about. 
Um, and you can you can sort of obviously look it up very easily. It's just Google Roger Kneebone Experts is the title of the book. Um, but I think that's a good that's a good example in that um, clearly his academic focus is reasonably tight, even though education is a broad subject. He um, comes from a specific background. The the crucial um, point is that he um has broadened his research for uh, the widest possible audience by making it about expertise generally rather than about surgery um i can i notice that there's a request for the author's name written out i don't know how to do that <laughs> um how do i how do i write the chat. Chat. Uh, there's a type message oh yeah no i got it it's a, the bit was just beneath my screen roger Nebone. Uh, can yeah. I also, can I also ask uh, the uh, all the audience member not to ask direct questions in the chat function, but put it in the Q and A? It just kind of probably is slightly distracting. Um, is that okay, Jack? Or do you want this? To oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, thank you. we'll thank keep you, uh, we'll keep I'm attending. Uh, so you're quite right. I did yeah. send it. Try that, panelists and attendees. Thank you very much. I'm like not so technical, <laughs> um, as you may have guessed at this point. Um, Jack, to, when we were thinking of uh, giving a title for this mm. panel, we said, you know, how to get published. And yeah. both of us felt that was a wrong question to ask. So, can I start by asking you why is the premise of this webinar actually a false premise? Why is it wrong to start there for a writer? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think also somebody else in the chat, Yasmin in the chat box has also sort of asked a, a similar question. What's the process that a person normally goes through to get published and what's the time frame like? I think that that's similarly in a way, a, it's a it's a it's a difficult question to answer and it also to answer it in 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 direct terms by saying the process is, is this you do x y and z and it takes you 12 months um feels to me like a like a slightly piecemeal response and i think a better and more helpful response would be that the the um the most important thing um is that you have to write an excellent book and your energies and focus as a writer at the beginning of your career should be directed towards um, writing, I think, as much as anything else. Um, and certainly worrying about what the publishing industry and people within it are um, thinking and how they'll respond to your work feels to me um, like it may well be putting the cart before the horse. Um, I often talk about with my authors trying to focus on the things that you can control and chief amongst the things that you can control is the quality of your your work or certainly the amount of effort that you put into it. Um, what you can't necessarily control is what will happen when you send your first three chapters as, as, as mentioned to a, a literary agent. And if they don't like your book or don't respond to your your book, again, that's a subjective opinion of one person um, and shouldn't be taken as a um, as a as a as a sort of total response to the quality of your work. The first person I think that needs to be uh, to feel as though they have um, that your work has passed a certain threshold of quality is you, the writer. Um, and so you shouldn't be too, um, I don't know, too um, swayed by the opinions of others necessarily. Nevertheless, of course, we can talk further about what the, what the kind of um, pipeline of a work is going from you, the writer, to somebody buying it in a shop. Um, and I suppose that that is um, also going to be the nature of today's talk. But I'd also, I would like to sort of, it would be interesting to hear questions about 
uh, writing as much as it would be interesting to hear questions about the um, the nature of um, of the sort of publishing industry um, and you know how to write a cover letter and things like that. But but Jack, would you want to just since you mentioned it, would you want to just uh, lay out that the land what that pipeline looks like? Sure. Yeah. And then we so so at the very beginning of it is you, the author, um, and the book that you have written. So let's say you um, you you know have a great idea for a novel. You go and you write it for however long it takes you to write eighty odd thousand words. Let's say a year and a half, for instance. At the end of that process, um, you may well want a literary agent. That's not the only way to get your book published, it should be said. You can self-publish your book. You could tomorrow, if you have written something that you um, uh, want to share with the world, you can go onto Amazon, you can, you can self-publish the book. It's, it's, it's not so difficult. But the chances of, of the other people discovering that self-published book are reasonably limited without some kind of um, you know, marketing, publicity and so on behind it and um, I don't it's a lot of effort to go and do that yourself so a lot of people still um, seek publication by a, a mainstream publisher whether that's an independent like Faber or Bloomsbury or a large multinational conglomerate like Penguin Random House my former um, place of work um, so to get often times to get on the radar of editors at uh, a company like Penguin Random House, you need the um, services of a literary agent. There are, I'd say, I don't know the exact number, but I would imagine something like between 50 or 100 literary agents. They're not all based in London, but the vast majority are. Um, they're extremely easy to search for on the internet if you just type in literary agent you'll get pages of them. Um, the major sort of companies include Curtis Brown, Rogers Coleridge and White, um, and so on and so forth. Probably the best way to start looking for literary agents um, that you think you might be interested in is to look in the back of a recently published book that you liked and doubtless the author will thank their agent in the acknowledgements. So the acknowledgements pages are sort of right at the back of the book and amongst sort of thanks to, you know, husband and children and teachers and so on and so forth, there's often a, a note to the agent. Um, just search on the internet for that agent's name and their sort of page on from their company website will doubtless come up. Um, you'll be able to see who else they represent. And if you like some of those other authors too, it's likely that um, you'll find that there's some kind of um, crossover between what you've written and, and their taste. Um, the next step will be submitting to them. Most agencies ask in the first instance for um, a kind of covering letter, which covers like biographical information, who you are, you know, any kind of relevant, um, experience or, or information, almost like you would send a cover letter to a job um, application. So, you know, perhaps your your university education, if you're if you're a student and it is relevant to the the book that you're writing. Um, also, uh, I don't know, like perhaps you've had a short story published in a in a in a journal or online or something like this. You might mention that. Um, they'll also ask for um, a kind of blurb or a bit of information about the book. And that's quite tricky, I think, for a lot of authors to do. And maybe we can talk about that in more detail. But the short thing to say about it is that you are attempting to give a flavour of um, what the experience of reading your book is like, rather than relating the events that take place therein. Um, and finally, they'll ask for the usually the first three chapters or if, for instance, you have extremely short, or extremely long chapters, let's say the first sort of five to 10,000 words, you send it off to them and hopefully you get a positive response back asking to read the, the full manuscript. 
the agent will then read the full manuscript and all being well off for representation. Um, I should also just add in at this point that lots of agencies run various kind of competitions. Um, most agents are constantly on the lookout for people. If you're publishing short fiction, for instance, in, in journals or online or things like that, or if you're publishing writing more generally, um, agents are looking for it in the way that, um, you know, in, in the music industry, a and R people go to gigs to, to sign new bands. Something similar happens in, in publishing too. Um, and also publishing houses run competitions and things like that too. Penguin, for instance, runs a sort of scheme called Right Now, I believe it's called, um, which uh, is sort of uh, a mentoring scheme for, for young writers. So there's lots of resources like that that you can sort of look up. Um, and they may well help you get on the radar of either publishers or literary agents. Once the once you've secured representation, sort of signed up with with an agent, um, your agent will probably work with you on the manuscript for a period of time. This may be a long period of time, like a year or something like that. Me and you, some must have been working for about a year on on your novel. Um, maybe it's not very long at all. Maybe it's just like a very quick um, few changes here and there. It's different depending on where your manuscripts are and what kind of um, work the agent sort of will tend to do. Some agents uh, will maybe do a little bit less. Some agents will do lots and lots. Um, it's, it, these are maybe things that you could talk about when you first uh, meet agents. Um, and then they'll send your book to various publishers that they think will like it. Um, so much in the same way as agents have tastes and specialisms, imprints um, at publishing houses and publishing houses themselves also do. For instance, um, within uh, the division of, um, of vintage at, at Penguin Random House, Jonathan Cape, is sort of well known as a kind of very literary imprint, um, whereas Havel Secker does lots of work in translation and also some crime. The different imprints have different sort of um, focuses and your agent will be um, well placed to know who at which different place is the right person for your kind of book. They'll submit it, hopefully um, a sort of similar process that, will, that has gone on before in securing your agent will kind of go on again in a publishing house to secure you an editor. Your agent will represent all of your business interests during this time, try and get a, a good advance for you and a, a good royalty package. And that's the rough sort of, um, you know, pipeline of getting your book to a publishing house. There'll then be a sort of year when the publisher, uh, makes the manuscript into a book. So that will include, you know, printing it, editing it and so on and so forth. Um, and, and then, you know, sort of, there you are, you will then have your book out in the shops and in public. So that's a rough outline of the, of the pipeline. Uh, thanks Jack. I mean, one of the questions which uh, comes up and we have uh, uh, we had an email regarding this is when writer uh, writers do want to get published very few writers just write we may to put it away uh, mm -hmm. the question which often comes is saleability what kind of genre is working you know the thrillers yeah. are working so when writing this cover letter and when writing what kind of, of book we are writing is it important to think through a genre or should writers think of the book they want to write or should they think this genre works so I'll write in that genre. Uh, how, you know, given the competition, given the difficulty in getting published, how does one approach this? What, in what genre am I writing? Is it a question that one should think yeah. of? So this is, this is the, this, we received a question from somebody by email before the event. And this, this is ultimately, I think what she, she was asking. Um, I think that there's a couple of things going on here. 
Um, firstly, when thinking in terms of genre and uh, writing a, a sort of pitch to an agent, trying to secure an agent, the reason that agents have put something on their website that says, you know, I do literary fiction or I just do crime or something like that is to really try and um, give, a, give a general sense of, of what they're looking for. I think there are very, very few agents or publishers that are extremely explicit in the, um, in the kind of genre that they, they work in. The ones that are, are, as I say, extremely explicit. So, for instance, you know there are there are imprints of publishing houses that simply do, say, crime fiction, or simply and and only do fantasy novels or sci-fi. Um, likewise, there are agents that only work in those areas. So, if you aren't, um, you know, if you aren't sort of writing a fantasy novel, then um, definitely those people won't won't sort of work for you. But in terms of the, the sort of precisely what people are looking for, I think it's maybe better when you're at the stage that you're submitting your, your novel to various agents to go through that process that I mentioned earlier of looking in the back of your, your recently read books for, uh, you know, for the names of agents who might be sympathetic to whatever it is that your literary project is um, and trying them. I think it's maybe good to think about the literary agents of London as just this sort of big machine. And in a way, it's a big machine that's sort of there to work for you, um, but it's maybe slightly unwieldy and mysterious. You know, how it works is, is maybe slightly unwieldy and mysterious. Um, so you just kind of have to experiment. And that means sending your book to a couple of different agents. If they look like roughly a likely bet, if you think that in general, they have done work that you've admired or liked, um, send it to them, see what they say. If they say, no, you know, you, you haven't really lost anything. Um, but what they may well say um, is, this isn't for me, but I think it's very much for my colleague down the hall who loves this kind of thing. Essentially, when we're talking about genre, what we're talking about is taste um, and people's tastes are individual and, and, and subjective. The only way that you can really find out whether whatever it is that you've produced is liked by somebody else is by showing it to them. Jack, uh, you know, um, what perhaps you are describing is mm. is um, is a world which is very difficult to attain that you know you send it out and, and agents get back to you. Most of the times, most young writers or people who are starting out are mm -hmm. very happy to get any agent or any mm -hmm. kind of representation. And I say this from experience. So for example, um, so about 12, 14, uh, 12 years back when I first picked the first agent who said yes to me, I said, Yes, of course, and and uh, went with the gen uh, person, and maybe somewhere down the line, I find that's not the person for me for various reasons. And so it's a it's a difficult thing to be able to figure out who should be my agent. Some agents come um, more flamboyant than the others. Um, takes you out to the best places in town and woos you. The other agent is quieter, wants to work with you, but you don't want them to work too closely because you like a hands-off approach. How does one get a, you know, there's one thing of excitement of, yes, I've found an agent, mm -hmm. to a position where, is this agent the right person for me? How does yeah. one figure this out? Well, I mean, it's a personal thing, isn't it? Like, I think basically, if somebody offers you representation, you don't need to say yes. And you certainly don't need to say yes right away. You should go and meet that person and have a chat with them and make sure when you talk to them about your book, the, the things that they are saying resonate with you and make sense to you. You know, um, if they, if you feel as though they haven't carefully read it, or comprehensively understood it, or even 
haven't understood it in the way in which you want it to be understood, then it may well be the case that, um, you know, this person, it, it's not a good fit for whatever reason. I, I'd say that's quite unusual in some ways. Um, very often it's the case. Um, it's quite it's quite rare to, to offer representation to somebody. It's often an extremely long-term commitment on both parties' sides. So it's not something that is offered or entered into lightly on the part of the literary agent. Certainly it shouldn't be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely understand what you're, what you're sort of saying, but in a way it's like any um, relationship, any business relationship, if, the, if you feel convinced that this person um, firstly has something that they can, they can legitimately offer you, and secondly, that you will enjoy the process of going through that with them. If they seem like somebody you can trust, that you can talk to, um, and that really gets your work, I think that you're probably onto, on the right course. Yeah, I think what I was trying to um, get at, uh, and, and, uh, and what you're saying is that not to be too overcome at the first offer of yeah. the presentation and, and take it carefully because it might not work. As you say, it's a, it's a long-term relationship. Yeah. Uh, probably, <laughs> but having said that, the other side of the coin is you do not get too many people offering representation. No, it's, it's, it's right. But I mean, I suppose what you should remember if somebody is offering representation, you know, I, I personally take a very emotional response with all of uh, uh, approach with all of my authors. And I find it very um, like, you know, we can get into the sort of detail and stuff that I go into editorially with, with people. Um, but equally, there is an underpinning to the relationship, which is that A, I, I, I work on the author's behalf. Um, B, you know, I must on some level think that there is at least a chance of the book being publishable. Um, and therefore, there's some kind of, you know, financial incentive um, for me too. And, you know, I think that you need to make sure that you um, feel, as, uh, feel a sense of trust to, to play something precious and you know your work is something precious. Uh, it has a value beyond pure economics, I would argue. Um, and so you need to make sure that, um, yeah, that, that, the, that you feel okay with the person who you're entrusting that, um, that power to, I suppose. Um there is a, all uh, successful authors have this remarkably, uh, remarkably similar story of, oh, I have had so many rejections at the start of my career. Yeah. This is a favorite trope which everyone plays on. Uh, but as you, and you have explained to me, every writer is, each and every writer is bound to be rejected by somebody or the other. Would you want to tell us a bit about the once it goes out to the publishing world, what happens? And what are the best possible case scenarios and the worst case scenarios? So at both moments of submission, there's the submission of the author to agents and then the agent submission to publishers. Um, rejection is an inherent part of the, the process. Um, maybe it's easiest for me to talk about um, the rejections that I receive as, a, as an agent. Clearly, I, I receive more rejections than I receive sort of um, um, acceptances for publication. But then I send a book to maybe 20 publishers when I, when I send it out. And, you know, for a book to get published, I only need one. I would hope to have more because it's, uh, if there's competition between um, publishers, it's, it's usually better financially for the, for the author. It also means that you have options. So the, the, the process of trust that we talked about is replicated again when you come to meet your editor. Um, I think it's useful to meet more than one um, just so that you can have a sense of how different people would, would work on the book and publish the book. Um, the, 
nature of rejection and the the sort of um, the certainty of it comes in part through, um, I guess, just like the, um, the 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 fact of of publishing being a, a business. You know, a uh, an imprint at a publishing house may only have a certain number of slots that they can feasibly publish into in a given year, and they may have filled them all <laughs> when your book goes on on submission they may have bought a book that's extremely similar to the 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 one you've you've written in in terms of where they would go looking for for publicity and marketing and how they would appeal to to booksellers like waterstones or amazon to 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 try and get the book to the, the public um simply put you know different people like different things and and whilst your book might be in the right area for for an editor that doesn't necessarily mean that, that specific editor who publishes in that specific area likes your specific book um i think a certain amount of uh resilience about rejection is really important for writers particularly young writers or, or beginning writers because you're going to experience quite a lot of it over the over the years, and there's no um, there's there's sort of no getting around it. And I would say just on this point again, an, an oft kind of told story is also that um, you know, fourteen publishers turn the book down, and one publisher took a chance, and and then the book goes on to be a, a multi-million sort of um, selling success. And the, the kind of implicit um, suggestion is that those 14 publishers were, were wrong somehow um, and that they made a mistake because of the inherent qualities of the, the book. There's no saying necessarily that those 14 publishers didn't recognize the inherent qualities of the book. They just felt for whatever reason that they couldn't capitalize on them. Likewise, it's not a dead cert that simply a book being placed with a publisher just because the book is, is good or whatever will then go on to be a huge sort of uh, multi-million selling success. There's, there's so many contingencies and there's also a kind of team of people who make stuff happen. And that I think is where the sort of magic of publishing lies. If, uh, it was, if the whole thing had been done by a different agent and a different publishing team, who's to say that the outcome wouldn't have been different as well, um, because the book would have looked different. It would have, it would have probably read slightly differently. Um, there are all of these kinds of things too. So it's not simply that um, rejection happens because um, publishers often make mistakes. It's that success is a contingent on the way in which and who says yes and why. And. Would you say that your agent would be the person best placed to decide on which publisher, simply because of the, all the contingent factors that you are talking about now? Certainly your agent will have information that you don't necessarily, um, and presumably more experienced, particularly if you're, a, if you're a debut author. So, you know, a key job of your agent is to provide you with good advice and counsel. Um, that's, what they're, that's what they're there for. But having said that, something that your agent doesn't know is how you feel about a certain person or a certain idea. And if you feel uncomfortable with something that Editor X or, or Publisher Y says about your book or, or, want, or, or, or how they want to sort of market you or any, any, anything, it's, it's necessary for you to feel comfortable to say to your agent, I don't like that idea and I don't want to do it. Hmm. Ultimately, it's you and it's your work and that's what you're, you're the sort of, you're the sort of last point of responsibility for all of that. You don't need to say yes just because somebody offers you something. You can always say no. Uh, but two questions before I kind of open up to the house. Um, one is, uh, you know, most writers, young writers, almost always have a, sec a primary career and yeah. they write on the side. And yeah. there are very few who, who know that they're born to write. Now, um, 
how lucrative, perhaps not being the right word, but how, how tenable is a career in writing? Well, I sort of think it depends, doesn't it? Um, you know, uh, just to, I, I, I'm not, I'm not being um, facetious or something when I, when I say this, but there are lots of different careers that have you writing. Yeah. So, um, you know, journalism is a form of writing. Lots of academics essentially make their career by being writers. Um, I think there are there are lots of there are lots of jobs out there where the 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 the, the sort of process of writing is a, a core component to them, um, and obviously people make their living doing that. In terms of making your living by being a, a novelist or. or, or um, Certainly in the early years, it's, 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 it's unusual. And certainly before anybody has said that they're going to publish you, you know, you don't have any income. Um, agents, the model is not that agents will give you a year's salary whilst you finish up your edits. Um, you, you will have to be sort of funding yourself in some, in some way. Um, I was once told by a publisher who is also a poet and a writer, a guy called Robin Robertson, something that really stuck with me, um, which is that um, if you're a writer who will, will, will never make enough money to, to live on from your writing, and poets, I should point out, um, invariably don't, I think you can probably count on one hand in the UK the number of, of poets who solely exist through the sales of their poetry. Um, he said, if, you, if you're going to have to have another job um, to keep yourself writing, you should think of your creativity and your writerliness as being like a well. And um, a job will um, also cause you to put the bucket down the well and draw from those waters. Um, so sometimes I think it's not always necessarily, if what you really, really want to do is write novels, then having a job in which you're flexing your writerly muscle day to day, um, that takes up a lot of your time and intellectual kind of capacity and stuff like that, isn't necessarily um, gonna be the best thing for you. Um, certainly, um, I think that having a job in which you're able to take slightly longer periods of time out, like a sort of summer holidays sort of situation may be, may be useful for, for you. In terms of averages, um, I think that the bookseller put the average earnings of a writer through the sort of publishing system at something like 13,000, 14,000 pounds a year. Um, but I don't know if this is a mean or a median income, because clearly there are writers who make, you know, six figure, seven figure salaries. Likewise, there are writers who, who, who make hundreds of pounds uh, from their writing a, a year. So I don't know exactly how that average is, is, is sort of worked out. But if you think about it in terms of an advance, let's say your first book gets you sort of 30,000 pounds, that's roughly sort of 15,000 pounds a year over two years, which I think is probably roughly about the time frame that you would be talking about from end to end. Right. Um, there's another thing which uh, I just might mention here. Um, an editor at uh, now at Picador, Ravi Mirchandani said that do not leave your job the moment you get an advance. You might not get it for the next one. So, yes. so for those of you uh, who suddenly get very excited, that that also remains. Um, Jack, there's a question. I'd also, I'd also add one final point on this, which is that um, by and large, writers um, have to be out in the world living and experiencing things and doing stuff. Um, and so a job shouldn't simply be seen as an obstacle to writing. It should be seen as subject matter. Right. OK. Uh, there's one question which um, SOAS has been at the forefront of, you know, and uh, politically, so which is decolonization. Uh, and therefore, the question comes up is how difficult or how easy or 
you know, how ordinary is it for a person of color uh -huh. to get published in the UK and the US? Is it more difficult? Well, I mean, firstly, there's, there's a few moving parts in this uh, question. Firstly, I think in the UK and the US, they're very different countries with very different publishing infrastructures. In the US, for instance, there are far more um, imprints that are explicitly set up um, to publish, say, African-American authors. Um, we don't have so many in, in, the, in the UK. I, I'd also caution against that necessarily being a, 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 a good thing in general. I think it's in, in some ways it's, in a, it's a really important thing. But equally, um, simply because it focuses um, attention on getting non-white authors into, in, into sort of publishing houses. But I think that there's something slightly troubling for me anyway, um, that they are, the, the sort of ethnic minority writers are then being published in a different way to, to, um, to, to white writers. Um, as I, as I said, I, I think that, there's, that there, are, there are lots of reasons why um, sort of specific and specialist imprints are a necessary um, component of decolonizing publishing. Um, but I think there are lots of other things that people can do as well, people um, specifically working within the industry. Um, as uh, if, you're, if you're a writer, I think, um, that this, it does feel to me, uh, I mean, I've only been working in publishing for sort of 11 years, 10 or 11 years, something like that. It does feel to me as though um, we are in a time where big publishing houses um, and right at the very top are making a concerted effort to address the, the sort of pretty chronic lack, I would say, of um, of ethnic minority writers, um, UK based and internationally, um, in UK publishing, I mean. And um, so, for that reason, I think that there's certainly more opportunity than ever. There's a there's a genuine and um, and clear need for 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 books from from non-white people um, and I get the strong sense that things are changing um, and so I think that I think that if anything you should be um, submitting um, with confidence and, and a, a feeling of optimism I don't I should I should also say that I don't think that publishing is, is in any way perfect and I don't think that it has um, reached some kind of uh, some kind of place where um, where this isn't a problem, I think clearly is a problem. But um, I think that there is some energy and goodwill and um, actual concrete effort rather than just the sort of same old words and, 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 and speech um, to address the problem. Jackie. On that hopeful note, let's end this conversation between you and me and uh, open up. So um, we have a few questions which have already come in. Do you want to have a look and uh, decide on which ones to take? And then uh, for uh, the house, anyone who wants to ask questions now, please uh, start putting them on the q and I can't promise that I'll be able to take every one of them, but uh, we'll try and do our best given the time frame that we have. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's quite a few already have come through. Already it. in. Do you want to have a look, Jack, and uh, decide on which ones to answer? Well, let's just go from the top and work our way down. Yeah, all right. Yeah, and we'll try and be... How much time is there? We, so we, it's, it's four o'clock. I want to do about um, 20 minutes of this and then uh, perhaps have a conversation, Jack, uh, specifically on 
blurbs, um, writing that cover letter and title and just kind of end there. Uh, okay. If that's all right. And if the questions yeah, sure. come in. If, if lots and lots of questions come in though, I, I, I say that maybe we keep trying to answer them all. Okay, fine, fair enough. Let's, let's start with the first one. Okay, shall I read it out? Uh, I, uh, yeah, please, please. Okay, so hi, thanks to this class. I've just been funded to edit and co-author a book bringing together other practitioners in my field. This is my absolute first time doing something like this. The book will be offering alternative ideas to Eurocentric psychology under decolonization. Do you have any tips? And should I, pub should I self publish or go for a traditional publishing route? Where can I learn about the technicalities and legalities, e.g. if there are multiple contributors, how do royalties, if any, et cetera, work? Any advice to signposting, oh, sorry, any advice or signposting to resources or anyone I could get mentoring from would be super helpful. Thanks in advance. For, so funded to, to edit and co-author a book um, of sort of various essays, I think. Um, I don't know if this is maybe like an academic book or whether this is, this is a, uh, um, this Something, is an academic book. It sort of sounds like like that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of academic kind of publishing, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not really, I don't really know anything about it. Though I'm sure, and some of you could maybe help out here, but like, I'm sure that there are resources at SOAS. Yeah, would, I mean, uh, so the SOAS uh, should be able to help in this. And also um, you should be able to, since you've got funding, you already, in a better place um, than other researchers or, uh, or academics. So you should be uh, looking at traditional uh, academic publishing houses uh, like OUP, all the universities which publish, you can look at Routledge. Uh, so there are many of, many of them. And the best way to, would be to send a proposal to these publishers. In academic publishing, in my experience of the last 15 years, you do not need an agent and you can approach publishers directly. Uh, but the first thing to do would be to give a brief synopsis of your project. Uh, the synopsis of the chapters would be good, uh, your career profile, and you should be hearing back from them. I mean, mostly I've never had an, a, a query go unanswered from publisher, academic publishers. I hope that answers your Query. Okay. Jack, anything else to add? No, other than uh, there are there are resources for for authors and editors um, at the Society of Authors. Always a good place to start if you have if you have questions. If you join the Society of Authors, they will look at all of the. Um, they'll look through a contract for you, and and they'll help you with legalities and stuff like that. Um, so uh, they're more for sort of trade publishing, but um, but yeah, I mean a good place a good place if you have questions like that. If you've been sent a contract, say they'll they'll look at it for you. Right. Uh, is there a topic that has been overwritten, Jack? So we create something more innovative. Um, is that a right place to start thinking, or? Uh, whew, that's an interesting question in in lots of ways. I mean, I don't, so it depends really what you're doing, I suppose. Sorry if that's a, a really sort of um, lame answer, but if you, there, there appears to be no slowing for the, um, the thirst with which people have for, um, you know, crime novels, say. There, there's an endless supply of them. Many more of them get published every year, including by debut authors. And they, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a huge sort of part of the, um, the market. Um, clearly, the, the sort of setup of somebody getting murdered and then somebody else finding out who did the murdering um, could certainly be described to be overwritten. But I suppose um, the evidence is that it can't be because people still want to, to read that story. I'd actually even go one further and say that people often, people by which I mean readers, um, feel a sense of um, comfort or in, in familiar stories too. Um, however, as, as authors, um, I hope, particularly, you know, young authors starting out, you know, I hope that um, 
you have a desire to be innovative purely um, because it's it's interesting. You know, the, the novel is called The Novel. Um, that is to say that it, it's supposed to be something new and, um, and different. Going back slightly to the, the point that we were just talking about regarding um, uh, ethnic minority authors, I think that in a sense, there's an inherent interest in um, novels telling stories about um, ethnic minority people in the United Kingdom at the moment because they are underpublished. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I would say that there isn't necessarily a thing, uh, there isn't necessarily such a thing as um, something having been overwritten. Um, as long as you can find a way of doing it um, that, that sort of plays to all of your strengths as a writer more generally. Uh, I think we missed a question as well above that one. Uh, what do you think about that though, Somnas? I feel like well, I'm- can it, can it be ascertained if one has a saleable idea? Yeah. It's kind of the same trope. Um, what's a saleable idea? Yeah, I. so I mean, one thing that you can do is think, well, you know, here are five books that do vaguely similar things, but slightly different to what I've just written and they all did well, but give some kind of proof of concept, right? Or there's some kind of evidence that people in general like uh, this sort of a book. Um, but as for um, this idea that you have a great story, but it might not be something that publishers think can be sold to the audience. Again, that feels to return to something that we were talking about really at the beginning of this um, session. I, I, I have a fear in, in some ways that um, until you try, until, until you have seen whether or not publishers um, think it can be sold to the audience, you simply won't know. So there's, in some sense, there's no, no need to really worry about it. You should focus on, on making that idea into the best book that you can possibly write, um, regardless of, of, of your um, sort of um, preemptive concern over whether a publisher will be interested or not. You'll find out whether a publisher is interested or not when you have a, a book that you can show to them. Uh, we'll go one after this, an in interesting one. I have a lot of ideas, but I have a writing block. Any tips? Uh, well, I think all writers will have experienced um, a, a form of writer's block in, in some ways. Um, and I think all writers equally will have a certain, a certain time felt as though they didn't enjoy the process of writing. I don't think writing is like fun per se. If it's, a, if you know what I mean? Like it's not like fun in the, in the way that sort of watching TV or something is, is, is an enjoyable uh, way to pass an hour. It, it requires effort. I think the best way of getting out of a kind of uh, uh, a block is, is probably the, the most boring way as well. Uh, which is to set a routine and stick to it. Um, so if you have a great idea for a story, maybe a, a way in which I often work with people is to set aside an hour a day and um, maybe it's first thing in the morning or whatever, it doesn't really matter when it is, um, but the actual fact of that hour is a, as a sacrosanct period of time that you work on your writing a way in which you can sort of start chipping away at an idea is to start off by using that hour to just write out the idea, write out the idea in as much detail as you possibly can, then break it into segments, let's say into sort of beats of what the story is or what the, uh, what the sort of um, idea, um, how you can kind of like break down the idea. Um, and then in each of those hours, over possibly a period of months, even years, you uh, you try and flesh out um, those kind of headings, if you like. And slowly but surely, if you turn up every day and do an hour, you, you will write a book. But there's no kind of getting around the fact that writing is hard and takes a long time. 
Yeah, may I come in here, Jack? A um, couple of things I'd just like to say from my experience, you know, um, having written a few books, both academic and fiction, and this particular manuscript. Um, so I started writing this in about 2013. And my aim initially every day, I used to write 500 words. I mean, make it a point to, that some days I could write a thousand, some days I wrote 5,000, but a minimum of 500 words. And as Jack says, within a year, I had a pretty uh, hefty manuscript. I mean, it's not always the best way because I found the, the manuscript stretching to 250,000 words by the end of that process. So that was too big uh, and you know, it can go here and there, but this idea of that you have to write every day is a very good one. And um, I also come from a background of journalism. So about 10 years of journalism instilled a discipline of writing an article a day, uh, whether it be 500 words or a thousand words. So it's, it's good practice, even if you're not writing a novel or you intend to write a novel, writing something every day is not, uh, will not necessarily go waste. And writing various kind of um, stuff just to, what would I say, um, kind of get your muscles uh, ready yeah. for a big adventure. And it is an adventure. And the other thing is a quote from one of my favorite uh, writers, and Ernest Hemingway. And I think many of you would have heard this. He says that writing is easy. Every day I sit at the typewriter and I bleed. So it's not an easy process. Um, and many people do not, many writers do not enjoy the writing part of it. So, yeah, should we move on, uh, Jack? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Malik's question, I think uh, we cannot see messages typed. We haven't typed much, so we can move on from those. Um, Navidif is saying, hi, I've been approached by a publisher to publish a book, congratulations, arising from a conference I just organized. It will be publishing the papers presented. Would I still require an agent? How do I respond? What are the opportunities and pitfalls I should be looking for? Thanks. Can I answer this, Jack, having done yeah. this? Yeah. So Navadev, um, hello. Uh, I have uh, done what you are saying you are about to do a couple of times. Uh, as a PhD scholar in SAS, we organized a conference uh, and got a publishing contract from Routledge. And we published it together uh, with Routledge, bringing all the contributors. One of the difficult things of that is, yes, you get the publisher's contract and you send it to all the participants. The most difficult thing was people come to a conference, present a paper, but to get them to write it, get them to edit it, get them to publishable form uh, is, is the difficult part. Everything else is taken care of if you have a publisher generally. And in a, of course you have to know what kind of a publisher, you haven't said that here. But uh, the difficulty you will find is in getting it into coherent form, writing the introduction, putting perhaps your own paper there. And I've done this a couple of times. Uh, in fact, two, uh, two of my books have come out in the, uh, with um, Routledge in the same format that you were talking about. And the most difficult thing was getting everyone together and to have a vision, uh, overall vision of the book. So uh, you, you could say yes to the publisher, uh, get a time frame. Uh, also tell your co-authors what kind of a time frame you've given uh, when you expect the papers back. Then do remember that you'll have to edit them. They'll be sent for peer reviews. Uh, there will be loads of questions asked and you'll have to redo it and then send it back again. And then you'll have to work with the publisher on the final final draft. So it's a it takes about a couple of years at the very least. But uh, congratulations on, on getting a publisher to the first step. Is, uh, Jack, that next question is for you. Is there a platform to see publishing competitions for nonfiction? Not that I know of. Um, maybe, maybe you could try something like the Writers and Artists Yearbook might have a list of competitions for nonfiction. I think the Writers and Artists Yearbook now is also online, so you don't need to buy, I mean, like, when I first sort of started out it was this big sort of doorstop like the yellow pages and um, I believe now you can just get it online. Um, I would also imagine, um, I would imagine that um, a good place, and I'm gonna sort of 
again, sort of my lack of technical expertise, but I know that a lot of um, competitions are advertised through social media. And so if you're following um, places that say publish or work with nonfiction um, in various ways, you may well see them advertised there. Um, right. But I, I, as, for, as for a specific platform, I don't, I don't know if there is one. I don't think that there is one. Uh, it's uh, just to let everyone know it's quarter past four. We have got exactly half an hour. We have to be out of this place by 6.45. I'll try and take in as many questions as I can. Uh, the next question, Jack, is the process the same when you're interested in finding publishers for short story collections? Yes, it is basically the same. The only points of difference are that some agents may say on, on their little blurbs on their websites that they don't, um, they're not looking for short story collections, they're not looking for short stories. Um, and in general, debut short story collections are, are trickier because the, the market for them is smaller. But it's not impossible. Um, and indeed, all three of uh, three of my first deals when I was an agent at the Evite Literary Agency were short story collections for Jesse Greengrass, Daisy Johnson, and Chris Power. So um, yeah, short 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 literary fiction is um, is still being published, um, though it is a little bit harder. I would also say there are there are a few places, sadly not that many, that are publishing individual short stories, journals, and um, you know literary reviews and stuff like that. And that's also a good place to start putting yourself on the radar of the of the publishing world at large. Um, in fact, Jack, may I just kind of ask you to elaborate a bit on this uh, given uh, earlier questions. Um, there was a very interesting process in how you located Daisy Johnson and Daisy Johnson, uh, for those of you who might not know, is the youngest shortlisted Booker Prize nominee um, and Jack was her agent. Uh, would you just want to Tell us a bit about how you found her and how agents do look for people in sure. unconventional areas. And the sure. second thing associated with that is when we talk about genres and what sells and what doesn't sell, Daisy is not the most obviously selling uh, author that one would, you know, if somebody told me short stories about the fen, I wouldn't probably jump at it, but look at the market made because of spectacularly good writing. Mm. So we just want to elaborate on this uh, a bit. Sure. Uh, I mean, um, so the process was that Daisy was doing an MA at um, Oxford, uh, on Oxford University's MA in Creative Writing. I believe it was, yeah, it was Oxford. Um, agents go to lots of those kind of creative writing MAs, the UEA, Bath, um, there's, there's loads now. Um, and agents are sort of looking at all of them. Most of them will publish a kind of um, like a little journal um, that collects the, the, the students' work. And that's what happened here. I read an extract of about, I think it was about sort of 800 words or something like that. I really responded to the, the writing I wrote to Daisy. I think she sent me a, a short story or two. I, I don't really remember exactly what it was, but it certainly wasn't very much. And she hadn't finished uh, a book and I offered representation and then we worked together on the book that became uh, Fen. Um, that's quite actually a common way of, um, of, of things happening. You know, as I've mentioned a couple of times, there are agents looking in, uh, in journals, you know, um, that are published at the end of MA and creative writing courses, but also most universities will have a kind of writing mag of some kind, uh, whether it's online or, or, or in print. Um, or we'll have a writing society and um, often agents are sort of um, looking at those kind of things. There are also a, lots of different and sort of small um, journals or, or sort of literary mags that publish short fiction like Aesthetica, for instance, in the UK or, or The White Review. There's, there's, there's lots. Um, and yeah, agents are also proactive. They're not simply waiting for you to send them work they're trying to get ahead of everybody else and find people who are who are writing and starting to publish okay 
Um, the next question is from Fatou. Actually, sorry, I would just I would just add one last thing there, which is that um, whilst it is great to be publishing um, short fiction, um, if you are trying to work on a on a short story collection, um, it isn't always the best thing if everything has already been published elsewhere and is available for free, because um, you know there's some value for a publisher in the stories being original and exclusive. Um, the next one is on, um, do you have any tips for those of us who are used to an academic writing style, that is writing an MA and PhD thesis, and want to write for a wider audience? Can I start this one, Jack? Yeah, sure. A uh, couple of uh, things, Fatu. One of the, one point is that your MA and your PhD thesis can both be published. Um, I have had several students who have written excellent dissertations, master's dissertations, and I've aided them in getting them published in journals. Uh, my own PhD thesis was published into a book form by Routledge. It takes a bit of work to turn a PhD thesis into a book format, and you have to give it about a year, but it can be done. It's best not to start writing MA dissertations and PhD thesis thinking you will turn them into books because they're two different beasts. And should not be uh, you know, put together in the beginning when you're writing something else. That is one. But you are also asking a question which is about writing style and ri wanting to write completely different things for a wider audience. Now, I want to answer this a bit because I have done both. I have written academic books and I write for a wider audience through journalistic pieces and, and uh, novels. They, again, you put on a different hat. You forget that you're writing an MA and a PhD thesis and you are writing whatever you are writing at that point of time for a wider audience. And you do not necessarily think, I don't know, Jack, is this a good question to think of? Um, Imagining an audience, you know, mm -hmm. is that a place one starts to think, or do you, uh, for example, I, I um, as a writer, I tend not to, at least in the initial stages for several months at a stretch to a few years, do not think of an audience. I just think of what I want to write and how best I could write it. But uh, it could be that you go down a wrong route and uh, your audience has no understanding of what you're doing. Where does one start? Is there a mid middle point somewhere? You know, I think there might be. Uh, so the the novelist Stephen King uh, wrote a great book about writing called On yes. Writing. And he, he has a chapter dedicated to um, what he describes as his ideal reader. Um, and in it, he, he says that he imagined when he was a when he was a, a young writer, he would imagine the person who um, he most wanted to read his books and who he was writing for. And he sort of talked about he imagined, say, a, a healthcare worker or a teacher or something like that. Um, on uh, reading reading his his work like on the bus whilst commuting, um, and sort of rather happily for him this neatly described his his wife who was a who was I think a nurse um, and had a long commute um, so he wrote with his um, with his sort of wife in mind um, and I think that mm. making specific a, a, an audience into like an individual person um, whom you can imagine reading the book I think is is potentially useful um, in uh, and sort of following on from what you said, that person can to an extent be you. You know, you can, you are also, I, I, I assume um, the, the, the writer of this question's name isn't um, available, but yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I assume you're, you're uh, you know, a reader too. And um, you know what you're looking for in a book. The trick with writing is to then translate that so that you're, you're in a sense, giving yourself what you want, um, that you feel is somehow not, um, not out there. And I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like a, a great way of, of kind of conceptualizing what writing is or, or sort of good um, writing could be 
is um, to try and create uh, the book that you would love to read yourself. Yeah. Thanks, Jack, on that. Um, I'm going to uh, skip the next question, which is talking about the PhD process and competitive academia. It's not the area where we are going to today uh, and with Jack and me. So I'm going to, you know, not really, uh, this is not the space. I'm going to come to Yasmin's question. It's an important one, Jack, we have been talking about it. What is it in the writing slash manuscript that catches the attention of an agent immediately? Well, I think that that's slightly dependent on the agent, though I can definitely talk about me. Um, I, um, it, when I first open a, the document, usually I'm reading on a screen, when I first open the document, I'm looking for um, some kind of flair for language. Um, this is in fiction, I should be clear. Um, I'm, I'm looking for some, some way in which the actual writing um, expresses a kind of sensitivity to the potential that words on a page um, have um, to convey ideas in, in not simply um, sort of clear ways, but also in beautiful ways. Um, after that, I'm probably most drawn to character. I look for writers who are able to make people that I think seem real um, and who I'm interested in. And then from there into whether I'm sort of drawn into the world and the story that is being um, portrayed. As I say, different, different people are, are looking for different things, but that's a, at least a, a personal response. Cheers, Jack. Uh, I'm going to ask you to have a look at Simon's question, Simon Atkinson. Uh, it's right down your alley as um, when you were at Viking, um, which is non-fiction publication. Yeah, Simon. Okay, written an 8,000 manuscript of an academic book about yoga that will have a large readership outside of academia. I'm confident it's a good piece of work. I intend to approach a publisher directly without an agent. I teach academic writing in a university and I used to be a journalist, but my qualifications are in subjects unrelated to the book topic. I need to write a book proposal. What is it important to include? Okay, so um, I'll try and keep this as clear as possible and sort of bullet point it. So you have sort of obviously the title with the subtitle, then a kind of one liner, a one line pitch on what the book is. If you like, this is almost a, a an extension of, of the subtitle. Perhaps the subtitle is a question. This is a one line answer to the question posed by the subtitle. Um, so for instance, you, you mentioned that yours is an academic book about yoga. It could be that the subtitle is something to the effect of what is yoga? And that one line is yoga is X, Y, and Z. Um, after that, you need a kind of uh, sort of positioning statement or a blurb. This is uh, a couple of paragraphs that explain clearly what the book is, what it intends to do, what its promise is, um, what the reader will get out of reading it. Nonfiction is quite different to, to fiction in the sense that often a reader will come to a, a book with a specific aim in mind from reading the book. They want to be informed about something, they want to be entertained about something, whatever it might be. Um, they want to learn something. So what are they going to learn? You know, uh, what, what is in publishing speak, we would call that the promise, what's the promise? Um, that's, I would say about sort of 500 to 800 words, but maybe no more than that. Then you want a chapter breakdown Whereas those first two things have been essentially about brevity um, and concision, here is where you have an opportunity to explain in more depth and detail what the book is, what the themes are that run through it. So you will, let's say you have 10 chapters, you have 10 bullet points, chapter heading for each one, and then a, a paragraph or two paragraphs on each one, what the chapter does, what it's about, what the kind of themes are, um, what that means for for the reader whatever it might be um then you would require an author biog so again all of the kind of relevant information 
you mention in your in your question, Simon, that you are. Um, I, I, I think if I've understood this correctly, you're not say an academic of yoga. Um, I think here is your opportunity in the autobiography to um, to give an explanation as to why it is you who is writing this book. Um, perhaps you are in some way an expert. Perhaps you have a personal relationship to the subject matter in some form. Um, whatever it is, I think that, that that's a place where you can answer the kind of the 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 larger question of why why you're the right author for this project. Um, then I would include a section on competing um, books and also comparison titles. So this is a kind of place where you can say, this book is like some other books, but it occupies a slightly different niche. These other books prove that there's a kind of, um, uh, that there's a kind of um, commercial track record for this sort of book, but this book is different in these ways. Um, and then finally, I would include a, a sample of, of writing, say uh, 10,000 words, 15,000 words. If you've already written it, you may as well include more rather than less, but certainly no more than 20, no more than 20,000. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, say, the introduction. You could jump right in at chapter two if you think chapter two is really interesting in a way that, uh, you know, the introduction, most introductions look kind of a bit like each other. Um, after that, maybe finally, just to wrap up the whole document, I would include specifications. So most, um, most um, nonfiction is sold on proposal rather than the full thing. So it would include a, a projected delivery date, specifications, i.e. how long it is, um, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so just the, the real nuts and bolts stuff that the, the publisher would need to know. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Jeff. We've got just under 15 minutes. Um, Vidya Venkat asks, how can a debut author protect the intellectual property rights of the idea as well, sending in book pitches? Um, well, there are, the first thing I would say is that in general, um, if, if, you're, if, if you're, your, your agent or your editor who you're writing to is, um, is a legitimate person, which you can kind of see based on, on what else they've done, you wouldn't really need to protect your intellectual property rights because it, it, it wouldn't be in their interest to steal your ideas. It would be m more valuable for them to, to work with you. Um, however, if it's something that you were genuinely very, very worried about, a thing that you could do is, um, post the, the manuscript that you send in to yourself or keep a record simply if it's being sent via email, that will be date stamped. And then if at a later date you see that say a publisher has published a book with your ideas that have been uncredited, you have a, a proof that you um, sent these ideas to them um, at, a, at an earlier date to the book that they've, that they've published. And that would hold up in court should you decide to sue them. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, I'm going to now be selective about the questions. Because, um, so there's a question from Jayanti. What about people who want to start writing or who do start writing at a later age, say after retirement? Is age also colonized within brackets or is it immaterial for agents and publishers? Uh, I would say in general, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, writing is, is quite a nice thing in that um, it's often the um, that there is research on this, but I think that the average age for a debut author is, is something like 42. So it's, um, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's necessary. And indeed, as, as with all things, thing, if it's something that you can say that your, your age and your experience has a claim on a reader's um, a, attention for, for whatever reason. For instance, I don't know, wh whatever that might be, but like perhaps you have been in a field for a very long time, say with so, uh, lots of people asking questions about nonfiction. You've been in a field for a very uh, long time. You're extremely experienced. In that sense, your age is very much a virtue. I also think that age in um, novel writing is often a, a, a virtue 
because the process of writing a good novel is sort of synthesizing experiences that have been had over the course of a lifetime and then turning them into, into stories that mean things. Um, so yeah, I would say, I would say um, again, not to worry about it. Right, Jack, um, next question. Ever handled an author with procrastination problems? And what advice would you give? That's an interesting question. I have. Um, <laughs> I, I have. I think everybody, um, I mean, everybody wants to procrastinate. Um, because as, as we were talking about earlier with the, the person who mentioned that they found writing difficult and, uh, and stuff, um, it, it is difficult and certainly it would be easier to to procrastinate than, than not. Um, I think that there are there's sort of it's a sort of twofold approach to procrastination. One is shutting down your ability to procrastinate. Um, and the other is um, um, sort of getting into a routine that you start to find enjoyable. So there's quite a lot sort of written about this in behavioral economics and things like that, that I've spoken to with, with, with authors and that literature is pretty widely available. So you can, you can track it down. There are books about procrastination, for instance. Um, but certain obvious techniques include shutting off your internet, keeping your phone in a different room. And I, I would actually say that these are essentials. You should just do it. Um, it will make your life easier and better. If you don't have the option to procrastinate, you're less likely to do it. Um, having a person um, who keeps you accountable to doing something. So for instance, perhaps you have a friend who is also writing something. You can, um, you can both say to each other, okay, in two weeks time, we're both gonna have 10,000 words or whatever it's gonna be. And, um, being beholden to somebody else, I think, for a lot of people uh, is useful. Again, this is one of the things that an agent can do if you if you have one. You can you can set up a delivery schedule. Um, you can be you can hold yourself to sort of smaller deadlines. I think that smaller deadlines in general are a good way to um, to um, stop procrastinating. There's a book by Anne Lamont. Um, um, I think it's called Bird by Bird, and she tells the story of her younger brother who has not done his homework. And it is about a, a sort of, he has to sort of write little pieces about uh, garden birds. And he is, um, he suddenly, you know, the night before he has to hand it in tasked with writing sort of 50 biographies or whatever of, of, of these garden birds. And he can't, he can't conceive of how to do it because it seems like too enormous a task. And um, his very caring father advises him to take it bird by bird. And Lamont goes on to use this as a, metaphor for writing, um, which is that you have to break it down into individual and component parts. Um, and then the other side of the, the coin, as I mentioned, is um, getting into a good routine. That hour a day that I was talking about is, is um, really the way that you'll sort of start breaking the back of, of say, an 80,000 word, word book. Um, so, yeah. Jack, um, can I also come in on this, Jack? Uh, uh, part of, uh, one of the things which I did as part of uh, my writing schedule for this novel was um, I used to write very early in the morning. I used to get up at four in the morning and finish my writing by six o'clock. And uh, not all of you will be able to do that, but it meant that I had a very clear head. And But to be able to write, do that two hours of writing, what I would do diligently every night, the previous night was um, after dinner, take half an hour out and think of what I'm going to write in the next morning. And whenever I have stuck to that routine, I found writing became so much easier. Uh, something happened in the process of thinking it through and going to bed and getting up in the morning and was just able to write. Um, it. The process was of writing was not as painful as it normally is. Whenever I haven't followed that, it always gets more difficult. So it could be some, an example you might want to think of um, following, just thinking it out the night before what you will write in the morning. Uh, I have got maybe two more questions. Um, 
question to Mr. Sumner. Is it common for academics to write fiction books too? Is it frowned upon or lauded at universities or academia? How different is the thinking and writing process for fiction and nonfiction? Um, is it common? I, I know many academic who have written fiction. Uh, what I can say is that uh, my academic work helped me think through my fiction in a far more coherent theoretical manner. But let me give you an example. Um, much of this book I have been thinking of writing, you know, everyone has a novel in them. So for the last 20 years, I've been thinking about writing a book about the small town I grew up in India um, and my three or four friends whom I grew up with. Now, everyone has the same experience. You know, they've grown up in big cities or small cities. They, every, all of us think our childhood to be special and beautiful, and I'm sure they are. But if every one of us wrote that same book, it wouldn't work. So I, as I said, I had this story I thought I would someday write, but then um, post journalism, when I came into SOAS for my PhD, masters and a PhD, I started to think through or get interested in more and more in the idea of nationhood and imagining the nation and how we are made to feel part of a nation and also being a brown person in London, how we might be not to feel you know, part of the nation or how you're alienated from the nation. So this interest and reading a lot around it, you know, um, Benedict Anderson and you know, the other co is a common name, imagining nationhood, uh, was the theoretical position from which I jumped into this novel. You know, and the, the, in fact, the first book, first portion of the book is called The Nation State, and, but are three individual stories um, springing from this idea of belonging or not belonging. So to answer your question, for me, it was not a hindrance at all. It helps me formulate my central thoughts very theoretically and then completely try and move away from the theoretical position and try and tell that story and make it more accessible. I've always felt that Academia is not necessarily accessible to each and every one. And I think it's a duty of academics because we are funded by the state to make it easy and accessible. And there's a lot of work now around it. So, and of course, a lot of fiction work is becoming part of the academic field. Also, academia is expanding in, a, uh, in that manner. Um, and the idea of what could be, what is possible, what might not have happened, but could be possible is becoming part of the conversation. Journal papers are being written uh, and academic work is being done very much on the possibilities of fiction in, in academia. So um, it's not as rigid as before. Uh, it's not necessarily mainstream too, but you know, we balance and, and uh, you know, it's a conversation which will carry on, but you will see more academic work becoming more and more accessible as we go on. Uh, Jack? I also think, I just want to add to that, like it, it follows on neatly from something that we were talking about earlier about how your day job shouldn't simply be seen as a hindrance to your novel writing or whatever uh, sort of other writing that you're doing either for pleasure or for, for general audience. Um, it, it's also subject matter and it's also um, hopefully um, an influence. And indeed, I mean, a lot of historians, uh, academics, writing popular books, um, you know, Capital right. being one of the ones which you meet, and, uh, you know, historians like William Dalrymple writing narrative fiction um, and uh, narrative nonfiction. So uh, there is a lot of um, movement between the two, but there are different writing styles per se, because academia de demands a kind of rigor and uh, not that non-academic uh, non books don't, but there's a certain kind of prescribed format to which you write. Mm. Yeah, they're different beasts. Uh, I, I must say that it's uh, now time that I have to, I've got a minute left. I'd love to just very quickly mention this, this next question on the, on the list is, 
are there organizations or projects or indeed individuals where people who don't have confidence can go for guidance, encouragement and yeah. support? Um, also those from minorities within minorities and for the afraid of being known or identified. How would you suggest dealing with this? I think it's a really great question. I know we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, let's do it. Uh, yeah, let's but, attend to this question. But there are, but there are um, various organizations and projects I, I did mention right now which is um, some, a, a scheme that, that Penguin Random House run. I'm sure too that there are organizations at your university, if you're indeed at, at SOAS, um, though universities in general will often have a sort of writing club or, or something similar. Um, there are various kind of writing groups across um, London and in and cities across the, the UK that are, are, are all really accessible and really open. Um, and there are um, sort of specific ones currently being set up um, with uh, a focus on attracting purely ethnic minority um, members to deal um, explicitly with some of the problems of confidence that you talk about. Um, so yeah, there, 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 are, there, are a, there are lots of different resources out there. Um, and I really hope that you feel the, the confidence to sort of make something of them because I recognize how difficult it is, particularly for writers and particularly for young writers. Um, it's the, the urge that often leads people to want to write um, is equally um, comes from a sort of potentially a lack of confidence in other areas of your life or anxieties in other areas of, of your life. Um, but I hope that the process of writing also helps you to uh, feel more confident generally. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm very sorry that uh, I have been told that this is it. I cannot take any more questions. So we have to end here. Jack, thank you for joining us. Stephanie, thank you for uh, doing all the work in the background. Uh, everyone who has come in, I hope you've found the session useful. And um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Hope to see you sometime and hope to read you all. Uh, sometime soon in this world. Yeah, absolutely. Jack, thanks very much again. Yeah, thank you very much for doing it. Everybody, this. bye bye. Bye folks.